how long can you wear a KF94 or KN95 mask for? That's probably the most frequent question I get followed by, what kind of mask is that? So today's video, I'm gonna talk, uh, walk through some of the test data that I have to kind of highlight what that range of values that we're seeing for mask usage uh, based on my usage in my condition. So everything is a little different, but we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about some simple methods to do face fit. Um, one of the most important things of a mask fit is having a good face fit. And I think um, not everyone has access to some of the equipment that I have or some of the other solutions like Bittrex solutions and stuff like that. We'll talk about some simple at home ways to do that. I wanna discuss about how do we handle and store masks. Uh, I think there's some question like, do I need to keep these things super safe? Uh, can I throw them and leave them outside? Can I put them in the garbage disposal <laughs> or something, you know, something crazy like that? Yeah, we'll kind of cover the range of stuff there. Uh, I think I also want to talk, uh, take a little minute, a couple of minutes to talk about a recent Danish study that came out that showed, as according to some people, masks don't work. I want to talk a little bit about that to provide some context about what that state study provided, but I think it actually gives a good indication about how important KF94 or K95 masks are. Uh, and then the last thing is I'll talk about what my uncovering testing is. Um, I think there's some interesting masks that I'll be, I got coming in. I'm also going to focus a little bit more on KN95s. I'm not a big fan of them myself just because they're like, you know, Amazon, eBay, they're everywhere and there's a lot of fakes out there, but there are some face sizes that work well. And I'm also starting to see them be readily available at Lowe's, the Home Depot, uh, and a variety of other stores. So those are readily available. So I ought to test them. And so, you know, just like I did with the filter 95 that was coming from Costco, I think it's due, my due diligence. If my goal is to expand protective masks, then you know, even if it's not my favorite mask, it's a protective mask for someone else and they might be readily available and they might see this video and say, oh, I can run to Lowe's and get some of those because man, I'm really worried about COVID. So, all right, let's dig into it. So the question first is how long can you wear a KF94? The short answer is between 30 and 40 hours in a clean office type environment. Less if you're in a construction type environment or you're exposed to a lot of aerosol. And if you're in a super clean environment, maybe even longer than that. But I think 30 to 40 hours is the good point. And I think the primary failure mode is likely a combination, both a reduction in filtration efficiency of the media, but also from the face fit that's coming from the ear loops. And I'll talk more about that. So let me throw up the data from my first test that I ran and I'll talk about what those masks are. Uh, so I'm gonna throw it up right here. Okay, so the I, I have two tests here. I originally back in September, well actually I guess I'm not gonna throw it up yet. You'll have to wait just one second. I originally tested this mask back, uh, I'm sorry, in August, I started preparing to do a test in which I was looking at wearing the same mask over a period of three days for a few weeks to get some hours on them and then I planned to test them and determine what the filtration efficiency was using my typical apparatus. And again, there'll be a raw video that raw data video that publishes after this where I'll put all the video of me actually testing the mask. So if you're interested in like what kind of apparatus, what did the data look like? I always publish that as full transparency. So if you're wondering like, how did, how did it work? Did I, did I do anything weird? Or if you're just curious about it, I'll always publish that raw data because I'm all about transparency. And I think it's a good way to show people about what I'm testing, why I'm testing and kind of just prevent people from questioning if I'm some weirdo wacko or I'm paid by giant KF94 lobby, <laughs> which doesn't exist, but you never know. I've heard it all so far. Um, it's YouTube for you. Uh, so I, I had actually a three tests, three masks that I was using. I was uh, wearing them every day, marking the back of the, I'd put it back in the sleeve. I would mark on the sleeve what day it was. I was just doing days at that time. And I put it in the little map holder right past your side door along with a couple other masks that I'd always just had sitting in there. Um, so I was doing that for a few weeks and then I was getting my son ready for school. He opened the passenger door up in my car and said, oh, dad, you don't need any masks. You have a bunch of masks right here. And I wasn't really paying attention. He was taking them out of the container. I was stupid. I didn't label the mask itself. I labeled only the, the foil uh, bag that it came in. And so they all got mixed up with a bunch of masks. I was really disappointed. I kind of took the week off in terms of mask testing. I was so frustrated with myself for being just a little bit too lazy to not have marked the mask itself. I just don't want people to see like a label or something on it and ask me what I was doing. But um, so I, I kind of screwed that up. And then it kind of dawned on me that I could still test them because in that I had four bottom masks and one Dr. Peary that were in that container. And I knew that three of the masks were the ones that I was testing, one that had been there a long time and one of the Dr. Peary. I thought it might be interesting, just test them all and see if I can resolve which ones are which. So there's a little bit of a caveat with the data, which I don't know for surely which one is this. I'm gonna guess that that's, I, I applied the hours into the data, which I'll stick up here, that, the, that, there's, that it's approximately 30 hours. I think those are the masks that correspond to it. It doesn't guarantee it, so because of that, and I'll talk about it, I did retest again. So let's just go to the first set of deaths. So I wore these bought masks for um, approximately 38 hours. Um, and so I started the test up. I again did my Moldex N100 control. 
got 99.5% filtration, so I think that's a good indication. I'm also using an Air Queen as a control because it's kind of that 90% threshold. So it kind of bookends uh, if we have something between 90 and 90, uh, 90% and 99%, I should be see repeatedly seeing those values in there. And again, the Air Queen usually tests about 90%. So again, I think it validates the, the capability of the, this method. Um, I wouldn't judge these as absolute values. They certainly may not be exactly 90% and 99%. So it's the filtration efficiency for my test aerosol on my face. Always put that caveat there. My test aerosol. It's not COVID test aerosol or COVID aerosol. It's not an, uh, a NIOSH test standard, like CFR 84 or any other test. It's kind of the aerosol I'm using. So, but I think it's I think it's a good exact. It, it's a good way to show differences in mass. Okay, so I tested the used button number one. Uh, I got 98.6. I bought number two, which again 38 hours, but 97.3, and bought number three. I got 96.3. Um, on typically a new button would give about 99% filtration efficiency based on previous test data. Uh, so there has been a slight reduction, about you know 3% um, reduction um, for the worst case, and maybe less than a percent for the for the one that isn't so bad. Uh, the used button number four came in at 90.4. And this mask, I, and I, again, I'm assigning that this lowest one was the one that's the oldest. I, I think it's accurate in this case, judging by what I see with the Dr. Peary, but that is a full disclosure. I, these masks got mixed up, so that could be one from work. I don't know. Uh, but I think that I think that's safe to say. So this one had sit in my. This is the very first bot I had ever purchased, um, and I had and it sat in my car. It's been in my car for about three and a half months. I use it randomly to go into stores, or if I forget a mask, or I drive to work and I forget to have had my mask, I'll use this as my backup. Um, so it has a random amount of use over three hours, probably you know 10, 20 hours, something in that range. And I was wearing it actually when camping with some friends and mountain biking outdoors. I I still you know I'm a big mask nerd, so I always encourage mask wearing even if you're outdoors. Just remind people that there's a pandemic happening. I wore it camping and then I went to bed that night and I set it down on the cooler and it rained that night so it actually sat outside overnight got rained on and dried um, and that mass tested at 90.4 percent I'm assuming that's the mass that that 90.4 percent happened because that's a long time so even at the worst case we started at 99 percent with a button and at the end of this very abuseful life of this mask it's at 90.4 now we compare that to the air queen air queen starts out at 90 percent now it probably will stay there because it doesn't have electrostatic media but I think I just wanted to highlight that I also had a Dr. Peary. This is again, one of the first couple Dr. Peary's that I had bought early in early July. It had been sitting in my car, so about four months of use. And again, I just used it randomly. I'd worn it a few times at work when I first got them um, and I was cycled them through, but I just kind of left it in there. And that one came out at 94.7 and a typical Dr. Peary test between about 98.3 and 99%, depending on the day and my face fit and quality of mask. So uh, again, we see about a you know, three, 4% reduction after a long duration. So I think it highlights that these masks are pretty robust and you can wear them for a good amount of time and still provide really good protection. Um, and, and again, this is for a test aerosol that's much, much smaller than COVID. So there's likely even better filtration efficiency. It's really gonna be dominated by leakage, I feel. Um, so one of the questions that we often get asked is, you know, can I clean my mask? And I always say, no, don't ever use isopropyl alcohol. It'll take the electrostatic charge and it won't work very well. Uh, I decided to test that. What happens if you actually take one of these masks and soak it in IPA? So I took that bottom number one. I took a, just basically a cookie pan or like a baking pan. I filled it with 95% IPA. Uh, I soaked the, the mask in that for about 10 minutes and then removed it and air dried it. I also did a same with a, the used bot number two. I put it a, another container with tap water, soaked it for 10 minutes and then allowed it to air drive and test them. Not surprisingly, the one soaked in isopropyl alcohol had a massive reduction in its filtration efficiency down to 86.7%. This is not surprising. This matches the literature. That is, if you want to remove the charge from electrostatic media, use IPA. Now, if you read those papers, uh, I think the, the inventor of this has quite a few bit of information about there about how to remove the charge. And typically what they found is that soaking in IPA removes most of the charge, but not all of it. If you want to remove all the charge, you have to do basically a fume of IPA. So basically like a hot vapor IPA uh, system where you purge that through the mask to strip it all. So it didn't remove it all, but 86.7%, so still a big reduction. It highlights you can't clean these masks. You just wear them and and then you can't wash them and you wear them for 30 hours and then they need to be disposed of. I, I think I recommend actually just keeping the old ones, marking them old, and you can use them for low risk stuff later in the pandemic in the spring. So there's no reason to just throw them away, but we, uh, but you can definitely use them. I also soaked in water because I was kind of curious what happens if you get rained on. I had a, a, a person email me, asked me, you know, is it okay if they get wet? And I said, yeah, it's probably okay, but I wanted to test that. So I just soaked in water. I did see a slight difference, you know, 97.3 to 96.3. So 
hard to say if that's a meaningful change in that or if that's just a byproduct of my test because I do typically see about a half a plus or minus a half percent depending on the day, how freshly shaven out, how good I am about getting the nose seal. So it's within the, the air of that, but I certainly think that it's uh, 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 an interesting test and shows that getting it wet is not a not really a significant change to the filtration efficiency, whereas IPA has a, you know, a, a strips the charge very, very, very quickly. So I also performed another test. Um, this one, in this case, I, I actually had a little bit better control. So I did, I did a three, my, three mass, uh, two, uh, two mass sample. I cheated, I, I, because I wanna get the test quickly, I just wore the same mask every day. I don't recommend that. I think cycling a mask is probably, the, it's not really probably that dangerous, but it's just one of those nice safety things and you should always have a couple masks anyways. So I, what I did is this time I, I labeled the, the container of the mask accurately with the time when I took it off, when I took it off. And this time I actually put a small tag on the mask this time too, so that I could, you might be able to see that I put a little uh, scotch tape tag on it. So I would know exactly which mask it is. I wore them then for all five days. Um, and so in this case, this is much better controlled. I will say again, what these cars, uh, the mass always sat in my car. So if I'm not at work, they were sitting in my car. In the spring is, or in the, in the summer, it quite hot out. You know, we're getting 90 degree weather and sitting in the car is probably 100 plus in there. Um, and these masks were coming in the spring. It's probably in the mid 70s, mid 80s. So it's still warm in the car, but also very cold. Um, and so again, I highlights. We'll talk about storage. I think there's no impact with leaving them. You don't have to be too gentle with them. They seem to be pretty robust. So test number two, I did that. Again, uh, the start of the test, I did my Moldex N100 control. I got 99.8%. Uh, I then followed up with the Air Queen, uh, same Air Queen that I tested in the previous one. I got 90.6. Last time I got 89.7. So it's kind of, again, it's good. It represents that I do get about plus or minus a half a percent depending on the day and everything. So it really depends on, on uh, exactly that. Uh, it depends on, you know, exactly how my face fit and stuff is. So I get about plus or minus a half a percent. Um, I then uh, tested the, the button number one. This one had uh, 40 point, 41 hours on the dot. Um, I tracked that time here, tested it at 99.7. I couldn't believe that. Uh, I was like, you know, I, I see the data in front of me and you can watch the raw data. You'll see it. I'm like, ah, that seems really, really high. So I tested it again. I uh, took it off brought the concentration up again, ran it again. I got 98.6, uh, which I think is just, if I would have tried done another time, I think there's a range of about 1% donning. So, I mean, after th 41 hours, it's basically like brand new. I mean, the last, the last button I had tested, what, brand new was 99%. So uh, I, I think without a doubt, 30, 40 hours in a clean office environment is very, very safe. Um, I also did my used bot number two. That one was at 96.7, so we did see a slight reduction. I did have a note that on 96.72, I did spend about an over an hour soldering, which creates quite a bit of fumes and some other stuff that I normally don't do on a daily basis. So I think there's, and, and we talk about what, what causes electrostatic media to lose its efficiency is exposure to aerosols. So the more concentration of particles of dusty environment, construction environment, it's gonna make the charge drop faster as they load up with particles. But for most people in a clean environment, and when I, mean, I mean clean environment, like an office environment, there's just really not that much, you know, particulate around. So typically you're not, you're going to be able to get quite a bit of hours. So I think between 30 and 40 hours for most people is totally safe. Um, even if you're getting into the mid 90s percent, I think you're still way better off than if you would ever be with a cloth mask. And if you're looking to extend your mask, I think that that highlights it. So I don't. I, and I think when we look at the, the, the test data number one, if I put that back up, that, that used button with IPA, I mean, even if you strip a huge amount of the stat electrostatic charge, you're still at 86.7% filtration efficiency. So that's still pretty dang good. It's way better than a cloth mask. So I think um, I'm, I, I'm gonna recommend people 30 to 40 hours, cycle them on a basis of a couple days just to be safe and we'll talk about that. Uh, but in general, I think the test data is kind of reassuring to me that, yeah, you can use these for a while. Um, and there's not a huge impact with them. Um, and so, you know, what are some, so I'll think, I'll, I'll change it up a little bit. I, I had lied, I was gonna discuss about uh, checking best fit, but let's talk a little bit about uh, storage and handling, um, and also talk about why I think the biggest change of why these masks are. So actually, let's talk about that. I'm, sorry, I'm not gonna edit this. I do this kind of live, because I'm trying to get this one out, because I think it's very pertinent to what's happening in the world right now. So the question is, why was there a reduction in filtration efficiency as we use the mask? So there's two things that are going to dictate when we reduce the filtration efficiency. One, the reduction of electrostatic charge in the media itself and face fit. And I think without a doubt, face fit changed on these. 
And some people had said they think the mat stretches out. I don't think so. I think the mat, I mean, I think you can compare it quite easily to, uh, this is a brand new button out of the bag. And I compare these two, they are exactly the same size. There's no stretch, anything like that. I think the easy, easy answer to say what happened is, and I observed it very quickly on this mask, I'll, I'm gonna adjust the ear loop to bring it in to be about the same length as the initial condition. I think it's very easy to see why these masks get a little bit harder to fit. Look at that. So if you look, the used mask is here. It's now noticed that the ear loop is like almost an inch longer. So the ear loop stretches out. So what happens on these masks is that over the duration, the elastic material within the ear loop is stretching. And it makes sense about when I was using old mask and you kind of remember the double ear loop thing that I kept getting caught because people thought that's how you're supposed to wear it. These masks are stretching out enough that this elastic is getting loose enough that I can easily do a double ear loop after the end of the week. I can't, if I start on a mask like this, even in the beginning with a double ear loop, it's really tight on my ears, but by the end of the week, double ear loop, it was totally comfortable. So it highlights that what's happening on these masks in terms of face fit is it's the straps that are stretching. This also matches some interesting data that people were doing about N95s and redons, like how often you could rewear an N95. And they found that it was really just putting on them, taking off the mask that was creating the problem. Well, it makes sense because you're stretching the elastic and it loses its ability to retain that elasticity and so how stretchy it is. And it loses the strength to hold it against your face. So it kind of makes sense. So what's nice about adjustable ear loop masks versus a bot and another is that it's easily just adjust it and tighten it up. So um, I think that's the primary contributor to why we're seeing the reduction is a little bit of change in the filtration efficiency of the media, but probably really dominated by the fact that the ear loops are starting to get loose. Okay, so that's uh, that's my hypothesis of what's going on there. I am uh, that. I, I mean, it'd be really nice to do media checkout on these. I, I could de design and, and build something like that. I just don't think I have time right now. I think my goal is to keep the supply going. So I think right now we'll have to just say that there's a combination of the two. Okay, so simple methods to create a mass fit. So I think one of the other questions. I mean, how do we know a mass fitting well? And that's usually the first question, like, how do I know that I'm supposed to wear this? Because most people have never worn an N95 and really don't really know much about masks. And that's okay, because why would you? So I'm gonna talk about what are some easy ways to do a face fit. So one of the first things when you're installing the mask is making sure that it's centered onto your face. That will always help. And you can use like some reference features, but I think the most helpful thing is go in the mirror at your house and just practice five or six times. I mean, I can do a button almost blindfold because I, I do it so many times every day now that I can, I, you know, I can, I know all the tricks to get my button to feel, and I know what the feel is. And that's the key thing you'll, and that's what even a professional fit check for people that are in hospitals that use n 95 is they know to learn to do by feel. They know what to feel for. Okay, so one way to do a fit check at home that I think is a really simple way to do is a lot of times people say, I'm not sure if I have a good seal. Do I feel things leaking? I kind of feel air coming around my face and air coming around your face is normal because when you breathe in, you suck it and it's gonna kind of, it gets a little humid inside the mask and you can feel your breath. But when you breathe in, it kind of clears that humidity out and you'll feel it cooler. But a simple way to test is one, what does a jet of air feel like? What I recommend is just taking the mask with your hand and holding it open and then feeling the air coming out. I feel a burst of air blowing against my hair. And when I cut, breathe in, I feel a jet of cool air blowing across my face. So make it leak really bad. And then what you can do is wear it again for a little bit and now that you kind of know what a leak is looking for, I can feel I got a little leak right here. Once you have a good idea of what it feels like, it's getting hot and it's getting humid after you wear it for maybe a minute. What I recommend is take your hand and put it around your mask and see if you feel a big difference if you seal it with your own hand. I definitely feel it right here. I have a little bit of leak there. So I can adjust my mask. Okay, now I'm good. Do it again. Oh, they feel the same now. Yep, it pretty much feels the same. Now, on heavy exhalation of these masks, you may notice that sometimes you get jets of air out. And that's kind of typical of a mask, and it's one of the disadvantages of an ear loop mask versus a headband mask, if we're trying to protect others, is that on heavy exhalation, it's pushing the mask away from your face, and that's expected, because there's pressure drop across the media, it takes a little bit of force to get air through the media, and so that force pushes it away from your mask. The good news is on inhalation, it collapses and actually tightens tight to your face. When you tight breathe in really heavily, it tightens to the face. And so that actually helps improve the seal on inhalation, but on exhalation, you do get a little bit. So on exhalation, if you're getting a little bit of air coming out, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's not that atypical. It's hard, to, it's gonna be much harder to seal on exhalation. Some people talk about fogging glasses issues, and I'll try to maybe do a short video about that, about some tips and tricks to do that. 
Yeah, uh, there's definitely medical tape that people can use. Some people are using band-aids just across here. Basically, to seal the glass, you have to you have to basically get this nose bridge really tight. But even with the nose bridge that's very very tight here, you can still get fogging glasses because the filtration media on this mask, both this bottom um, section of the mask, the middle section, and this top section are all full of filtration media. So when you breathe out, air is coming this way. It's coming this way, and it also comes out this way. And because the air is hot. It's buoyant, it'll drive up. And so what happens is that some of that air is just naturally going up across your face. Um, and so it can fog your glasses. So I work in a laboratory with microscopes oftentimes and wearing a mask like this, all, even though I have my mask on and I know I have a good face seal because I practice all the time, I could still sometimes get fogging onto the microscope eyepieces. And that's that is. And I've seen some KF94s that I haven't found available here that this top flap they actually don't put a filtration media. It's actually not breathable. And so it blocks the air. And so that helps prevent the glass fogging. I haven't found those in the US yet, but I have seen a couple advertisements from some Korean masks that do exactly that. So that's a good way to do a uh, mask fit. So my recommendation is go to the mirror and use the mirror to really do this because it really helps you see to get it centered. A lot of times, the first time I give people a KF94 mask, they're usually way off on the side, they're crooked and stuff like that. And you know, it's not a criticism of most people have never used one of these before. So always be helpful if, you, if you're given one to a friend, help them out. Just say, hey, uh, you know, just center it up, you know, do the talk them through the face fit kind of stuff and help spread the word on how to do that. Uh, handling and storage. So what do we need to do with these masks to take care of them? I think the answer is you don't have to be too gentle with them. I recommend typically right, cycling them through on a three day basis, mostly because it's just an added level of protection. Um, I'll talk a little bit about when you talk about what is the risk of getting COVID from the mask itself, I'm not too sure. It seems like contact spread is not the mech dominant mechanism for, for getting COVID. Um, and I think arguably, and I'm not an epidemiologist, so this is just me kind of spitballing and brainstorming. I think it's easy to wash your hands. I think it's easy to do those sort of con classic contact spread things. And the virus naturally dies on itself. I mean, this virus, if it's on, the, you know, on my hand, or actually more specifically on something that's not alive, you know, it's good for th maybe at three days. I think the half-life, uh, I think the half-life was like six or seven hours. So in like 99% gone in like three days or something in, in that range. Don't quote me exactly that. But when we look at, so I took a, uh, uh, I took a Dr. Peary and I cut it. When we look at a mask layout, there's typically four or five layers of the mask. There's an outer layer that's the structural layer. In this case, the Dr. Peary, it's this really soft poly polypropylene problem. I'm actually I'm not sure actually sure what plastic that is. I shouldn't say it without knowing for sure. There's a melt blown layer on this outer layer. And then the next layer is a, is a support layer for the media. It's another melt blown layer. It's uh, thin, it's basically transparent. There's in the, the layer that, uh, that we really care about is the filtration media layer, which is like this white, kind of very almost, it feels like kind of like paper almost, but it's very plasticky. And that's the filtration media. This is the electrostatic media. And then there's a backing layer here. This is what's touching against your face. Again, this one's like super silky and smooth. And I like that, I like that material. The Dr. Puri feels great to handle. So when the aerosol comes through, it's gonna go first through the outer layer, get some of it's gonna get captured there. There's the backing layer, some of it's gonna get carried. Most of the small stuff, I mean, almost all of the small stuff gets captured on the front edge of, or the incoming uh, face of the filtration media. It starts to go through the depth of it. Most of it's getting captured. Some, of course, will then pass through. It's gonna get a little tiny amount's gonna get captured here. So on inhalation, almost all the COVID stuff is mostly inside the mask. If you touch the outside of the mask, can there be some there? Yes, of course, it's mostly inside the mask. So what's the risk? Well, it's small. I don't have some great data set, but. Here's why I do it just out of abundance of caution. I hope maybe there's some people that have some information about that. I mean, I could do some tests, but I just, it's just easier to just be safe right now. But my concern is what if you get some spit on this layer, a touch against your mouth, that spit goes into the filtration layer. It pulls some of that virus out uh, through the through suspension in your mouth. And, and then, uh, you know, you, that goes through your spit and you readjust. Uh, you know, is that a is that a possible mechanism? I, I think so. I don't know how dangerous. So I just use three masks and cycle them through on a three-day basis. Is it 100% necessary? I don't know. I don't have great data on that. But that's what I'm doing. But in terms of handling it, it's always a good idea to handle them by the, uh, not a good example of that one since it's cut up, but it's always a good idea to handle these by the ear loop. So if you're taking, if you're t putting the mask on, it should be upset for three days. So it's fairly safe to handle on the way in. When you're pulling it off, then, you know, I would recommend if you're really worried about it, just grab it by the ear loop, take it in, fold it. I usually, I just keep these plastic sleeves. I drop it in here, 
I write the day of that on it. It goes back in my car. I don't even, I just store these all in my car. And I, I mean, the data seems to indicate that there's no big impact of just storing it in the car. It's not super dangerous. And if you want, sanitize the hands and you're basically good. So uh, you do not need to keep them anywhere special. I would recommend to, to allow some air in there for a couple reasons. One, you've got a bunch of spit and moisture in there and you just don't want it to get funky and nasty. So leaving the bag open on the top can let air get in another and let this effectively dry out. You can leave this out. I mean, so you don't have to be like, these don't need to be handled with kid gloves. Uh, I mean, that three and a half month, that mask that's had my car for three and a half months, it, uh, it survived in the rain. It's in the car in, in Minnesota is very, very hot and humid during the summer and that car's even gonna get hotter. I don't think you have to handle them too much with kid gloves. You're still gonna have plenty of protection. So it, it's really encouraging to me that they're, they're really robust. Uh, I only tested the Botten and one Dr. Puree. Does this apply to all masks? Most likely, I can't guarantee that, but most likely all masks are using very similar media and same technology. So I wouldn't be wor too worried about it. KN, KN95s are gonna be very similar. They're all basically using electrostatically charged melt blown material. Um, the Air Queen is probably the oddball one. It's the only one that you can wash with isopropyl alcohol and stuff like that. But, it, you know, the 90% filtration efficiency, I don't think it's really worth it. You might as well start at 99 and make your way to 90% efficiency and have way better protection the whole way than to be able to clean it with IP. I just, it, they're a protective mask. They're just not my favorite for that reason. Um, the, so there's also, so I'll move on to the next topic, uh, the, this Danish study that came out that has been sort of controversial. And basically, you know, I, I spent some time to actually read through the full analysis and it was kind of an interesting read and kind of how they did it. It's kind of just a population survey asking people who wore masks uh, and then what percentage of those people did or did not get COVID. Um, not surprising to me uh, that the data, it's really hard to say. It's just ba ba the only conclusion they can say is that uh, the, basically the, that wearing a mask does not greatly uh, reduce your rate of getting COVID-19. Uh, okay, sure. I'm not surprised by this. Most people are not wearing protective masks. So if you are not wearing a protective mask and someone else around you, if you're wearing a cloth mask or a surgical mask and someone else around you is not doing that, yeah, it turns out that if you wear a mask that doesn't protect you, it doesn't protect you. I mean, this is the study, the, the, the data from the study is not surprising to me in the slightest. The point of wearing cloth and surgical masks is to protect other people. And the study couldn't really conclude about that because they weren't asking people that interfaced with people with masks. They also didn't really ask what type of mask. And we, I have seen personally a huge range of masks, most of which I think are complete garbage. And I mean, from a protection standpoint, from a protecting other people, cloth masks, surgical masks, yes, they do that. But we're way too far into the pandemic to still be relying on that. So what did the Danish test? And I think they correctly stated in the title, uh, masks, when we'll say are mostly probably cloth and surgical masks, do not protect the wearer. Agreed. And the data that I've collected has shown that over and over and over again, that cloth masks are not protective. Now there is a CDC posting that recently on their website, they're saying, well, cloth masks provide some level of protection. They do. Cloth masks do provide some level of protection. It's just not very good. It's 20, 30%. I mean, you, you can look at my previous video where I tested the, the surgical mask with basically the plastic nose clip as garbage, 20% filtration efficiency, which is probably greatly overestimated in my test. I'll talk about maybe that in another video or if someone ever wants to have a deep dive into this about why I suspect that my test is overestimating filtration efficiency on the very low end when you have very low filtration efficiency. So yeah, it turns out, yeah, that's not surprising to me. That doesn't mean that masks don't work. They do work if we all wore them. Uh, a good math that arrest droplets and respiratory aerosols are coming out and you could capture those. Yes, those are helpful. And I think we should all at minimum wear a cloth mask. Next, if you can get your hands on surgical mask, get your hands on surgical mask. And in my opinion, at this point in the pandemic, we should all be wearing KF94s because we would be getting 90% probably because most of it's going to leakage is going to dominate on the breath out because it's going to push the mask away. But let's say we get 90% on the way out and 95% on the way in. I mean, it's a massive improvement. I think my camera detected my short rant there, so I'll have to cut that in. Uh, so yeah, 130X was about just a general rough back cal calculation, assuming like 50% filtration efficiency uh, on the way out and 30% on the way in or something in that range and then 90 and 95. Uh, so to summarize that quickly, we still need to do social distancing. We still need to work from home when we can. And when we're not doing those things, we should be wearing KF94 or K95 masks or N95s, but save the N95s for the, uh, for the healthcare workers. There is still a massive shortage. And I think that if anyone is bearing the brunt of this epidemic right now, or pa yeah, pandemic, um, it is the healthcare workers, undoubtedly. I can't imagine being in their shoes right now. So um, hopefully this video helps reduce the number of people that they have to see.
All right. Uh, yeah, that's a nice topic to end on there. But so what's what's up to come? Uh, what's what's new for me? Um, we're gonna be testing a much more mass. I got uh, a black buttons to test. I have uh, some other uh, so, some. Oh, I can't name the heel made and a whole variety of KF94s that I've been kind of grabbing my hands on. I got more KN95, some that I bought from Lowe's. Um, I've got some that are coming from some people that are sending in. Uh, I have the Respoke Air N95. This is the famous one. I've had lots of people ask me about the Respoke Air. Uh, I think everyone will be really surprised by this one. It'll take me a week or so to get this one out. I'll be doing it over Thanksgiving because I'll have some time to do it there. Uh, I think everyone will be surprised by that one. Uh, and so hang tight. Uh, if you want to subscribe, feel free to. Um, if you see uh, videos of me riding my bike around again, you'll know the pandemic's over. Uh, throw any comments that you have below. I'll try to answer as many as I can. Um, let me know what kind of mass you guys are looking at. And uh, I think I'll finish on the last question, and I'll use this to reference other people. How come I don't test reusable masks? Well, in general, my goal that I've been focusing on is expanding the supply of protective masks. And the reusable masks that I've been looking at are really expensive. If they have replaceable filter elements, they're $1 to $2 to replace a filter amount, which is roughly the cost of an entire KF94 or KN95 mask. And so I've looked at that and said, although I like the fact that we are not generating a bunch of waste, and I hate generating waste, <laughs> um, I really do. <laughs> I look at it and say, my goal is to save lives too. Um, so it's a trade-off that I'm having to come to terms with. But in general, I think the cheap, you know, if I can get a mask for $1.25 that provides extra protection and that people can easily source that, I should really focus on getting as many people into those masks. It helps other people, it helps themselves. So that will be my goal. I think there are good reusable mask options out there that probably provide fairly decent protection. Um, but I'm seeing prices of $35, $50, $60 dollars for a mask that you can use for maybe 30, 40, 60 hours. And it's like, that's an entire two months or three months supply of KF94. So I just can't really justify that right now. But keep throwing those at me. I do keep an eye on them. And uh, if you have, and there's all kinds of, all kinds of crazy battery powered widgemajwidgemajews of, you know, HEPA filtered thing. You know, it's like, uh, it's been $300 on a mask. I'm not going to probably test that one because I don't want to spend $300 on the testing. I mean, I don't think it's practical for a lot of people to spend that much money. So my goal is like, hey, let's get everyone to KF94s. So if you want to help me do that, share this to some friends, shoot me questions in the comments and subscribe and we'll keep you, we'll keep you updated on what the latest mask testing is. So thanks everybody and have a great day.